Hello, everyone. My name is Curry Stegan, and I am the host of the Passion for the Paranormal podcast show. Thank you for tuning into the show on my YouTube channel, and please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can check out other great content that's going to be coming down the road. Opinions and views expressed by the guests of Passion for the Paranormal are not always the views and opinions expressed by the host. Hello once again and welcome. You are listening to Passion for the Paranormal, bringing a passion for the paranormal to you. I'm your host, Curry Stegan, and uh, thanks for tuning into the show, everybody. Uh, tonight's show is a first. I've got two guests joining me on the show. Uh, have you ever had a life experience that really changed the course and direction of your life? So my first guest is going to be talking about a major significant event that happened in his life that really changed the course of, uh, and direction of his life. So uh, the, the first guest is Dean McMurray. He is known as the military medium. So he's going to be talking about the major event in his life that uh, really led him into his work that he's doing now as a psychic and medium. And then my next guest is going to be Jake Fife of Fife Paranormal. He's going to be talking about he and his father's team and the work they've been doing, uh, paranormal investigating, so that should be a great discussion as well. If you haven't already, please head on over to the Facebook page at facebook.com slash passion, the number four, the paranormal, and like the page there, and uh, you can even also offer a review on the Facebook page. If you're using the iTunes app, if you could please, uh, when you're over there and if you're tuning into the show there, please offer a review and then subscribe. That's, uh, that's a big deal because that's going to help others out there to find the show and be able to follow the show as well. So uh, please help us out and do that. Uh, if you're also a Google, Google Play user, you can subscribe to the show there as well. And uh, looking forward to great discussions on tonight's show. I really hope you enjoy the discussion with both guests. And uh, so I'm with, you know, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into the discussion with Dean. Hope you enjoy the show. Okay, uh, my guest tonight is Dean McMurray. And uh, Dean is an internationally acclaimed psychic, medium, healer, ordained minister, and is also a 24-year uh, Army veteran. Dean, thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Curry, for having me on. It's a pleasure being here. You know, I went, went back and uh, I had heard one of another show you were on. I believe it was on Beyond Reality Radio. Um, you were on with uh, J.V. Johnson, uh, Jason Hawes. Uh, you talked a little bit about your journey, which I think is a unique journey um, with your, your military background. You and I both come from a military background. Uh, you're a 24-year Army veteran. I'm a 25-year Air Force veteran, so it's not you don't see a lot of military people step into these kinds of roles. I've I've been doing paranormal investigating for many years. Um, you know, you're involved in energy work, psychic, uh, and mediumship. Can you talk a little bit about your journey and uh, you know how you kind of came into this? Sure, sure. Well, first off, I want to say, Curry, is uh, thank you for your service as well, and and as and as you I, I think it's interesting, though, because I think from your last statement, I would disagree with you just a bit because I'm actually running into more veterans that seem to maybe be coming out of the woodwork. We're just not aware of them maybe quite as much. But there's more and more veterans getting into the paranormal realm or in the metaphysical arena. So um, maybe the tides are churning, and who knows, but... Um, but, uh, yeah, so my journey really started going back um, nine years. And, you know, as I shared, uh, what well, you just talked about is, you know, yeah, I did serve 24 years. 14 and a half years was with the regular Army. The last 10 years was uh, active duty with the Army National Guard. Um, and But one of the things that I share with that is I wasn't open to psychics. 
always been open to mediums and energy and all that. And, you know, the craziest conversations that I would have is maybe with my wife about what uh, scent she would diffuse in the, uh, you know, the uh, for her, her diffuser or whatever. And uh, so that was the craziest thing that maybe I would do at the time. But um, about nine years ago, I deployed to uh, Kosovo with the Army National Guard. And it was my last deployment with the military. Uh, when I returned uh, from my deployment, um, a lot of paranormal activity started happening. And what I mean by paranormal activity is where a lot of uh, pictures and clocks quite literally started flying off the walls. It was like a scene right out of Poltergeist, right? And so for, for being a guy that went from not believing in this kind of stuff and not being open to it, and all of a sudden being immersed into that, I quite honestly had the you-know-what scared right out of me. And my wife had confided in me at the time that she had a local psychic over to the house while I was in Kosovo uh, to give readings and, you know, do some energy cleansing. And I was kind of joking and referring to this lady as the voodoo chick because that was my name for her at the time. And I was, you know, and my wife's name is Marilyn, and I said, oh, Marilyn, you and your voodoo friends. And, you know, this voodoo chick. And so, of course, the first words out of my mouth when all this craziness happened was, get voodoo chick on the phone, there's some crazy stuff going on. <laughs> and so this this local psychic came over, and she you know, said, oh, Dean, your grandfather is here. And um, I, I would start to look at her kind of sideways because, again, I wasn't in a space of receiving any readings, you know, and uh, wasn't open to that. And I'm thinking, and I quite honestly told her, hey, why the hell is my grandpa here, you know? Oh, he's here supporting you after your deployment. And, and I was like, well, where was he after my other deployments? I'm, you know, and of course I go down my long, long laundry list of deployments. And she said, well, I don't know about that, but the thing that I can tell you is he's here now. And I had this skeptical sideways glance looking at her thinking, really? You know, how much, kind of looking at my wife thinking, how much money are we paying these, this lady to come over? And, and I, and I just wasn't in a space to receive that. And, you know, it wasn't about my grandfather. It was, he was trying to bring forward a message. Um, basically, you know, I fast forward some time from her uh, visit a couple weeks, and things weren't slowing down. In fact, uh, activity was picking up. It didn't help anything. Um, and uh, I was washing bottles for my then newborn son, and around midnight, and I just had a knowing that washed over me that my deceased grandmother was with me. And I started having a conversation with myself going, how the hell do I know it's grandma? And because I've never had an instance of clear cognizance, and I was like, how do you just know something? It's like, you need to know, you know, it's like, did I read it? Did I, and it's like, how do you know it's grandma? You know, grandma's been dead for However long, it's saying, how do you know it's her? And, you know, I'm back and forth between myself, thinking, oh, my God, I'm really going crazy. This is it. I'm going to end up in the funny farm on some good meds. And, and But, you know, I kind of, part of me was like, hey, you know, it's my grandma. She's not here to hurt me. And, you know what, I'm just going to go to bed. It'll be better in the morning. And I'm laying in bed, and I'm kind of talking to her one way, because I think it's normal. You know, most people you know, wanted to, at some level, talk to their loved ones and, you know, saying, like, hey, I love you and miss you and all that great stuff. And But then it's like my ego popped up and said, you know what, Dean, if she was really here, she would prove it. And as soon as I thought those words, uh, she turned the room absolutely frigid and cold. Like if you walked outside in the middle of North Dakota, in January, when it's 40 below, that kind of cold. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> that, you know, so it was a huge temperature shift. And um, I was like, holy crap, I can feel that. And, and But it was funny because uh, my ego popped back up and going, you know what? The wife could have the uh, window open. There could be a lot of things. 
you know what? If she was really here, she would touch you. If she's really here, she can touch you. Otherwise, it's a bunch of BS. And again, once again, as soon as I thought those words, it was a gentle yet firm pressure um, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet that pushed me into the mattress um, and where I could feel it, you know, my body becoming heavier than the mattress sinking in, and I could hear the springs compress. And quite honestly, I thought it broke the fifth seal to hell because I was like, holy crap, how do you, how do you shut this off? How do you, you know, how do I make it go away? Right. And I was, quite honestly, it was like the little six-year-old little boy in me came out and saying, all right, Grandma, love you, see you soon, basically saying, you need to leave now. <laughs> and as soon as I said that, it was boom, it was gone. And, um, you know, no more you know, uh, temperature inversion. There was no more pressure. Um, there was none of that. But, of course, I'm sitting up in bed out of breath, covered in the light sweat, going, holy crap, did I just dream that? Did I make it up? Was that, you know, what was that? And my wife, who never sleeps deeply, um, she is out like she has never slept in her life. I'm waking her up going, hey, there's a spirit here. And she's like, what do you mean there's a spirit here? How do you know that? And I was like, right? I don't know. And I was like, you need to get a hold of that voodoo chick, and she needs to come over here. And she was like, Dean, it's like 2.30 in the morning. You need to go back to bed. And I'm like, well... <laughs> You know, that's pretty easy to say. I, you know, I think I stayed up the rest of the night freak, just freaked out and watching ski. And uh, so needless to say, it became a long day. Um, so really, that was my awakening um, back then of how it all came to be. And then, of course, just like any journey, one thing leads to another, leads to another. I ended up actually taking some classes from the lady that I called the voodoo chick, and I got to, you know, just share uh, that we have gone on to become friends. She's been a, a teacher of mine, so, um, and she certainly does not practice voodoo. I just want to share that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, but the thing was, is I love sharing that story because um, of so many people are there in that place and going, you know what, Gene, I just, I just, I don't know, I just can't bring myself to believe in that and that and you know what that's okay because I get it I've been there um, and it and it's not about a being in a judgmental place it's about just saying I get that and until you have sometimes a visceral experience or an experience of your own um, you know it's um, you know sometimes it is hard to, to swallow because it's like you can't really even conceptualize it sometimes. It's like, um, you know, and even people that, uh, you know, are really interested in the, in the field of metaphysics or paranormal, regardless of what it is, sometimes they don't even really get it until they have their own experience at some level. So it's, it's you know, so it's interesting. But uh, I went on to take a course in mediumship. Um, I was really trying to explore what it meant to be a medium, uh, what it meant for Dean McMurray, really. And uh, I took that. And then for a year, really, I gave readings, uh, you know, for, for family, friends. And then, quite honestly, people just started showing up or started calling me, saying, well, you don't know who I am, but I'm a friend of a friend of a friend. And quite honestly, it was being the medium, you know, it was being the soldier by day and being the medium by night. And, you know, it sounds kind of cliche, kind of a super heroish type, but quite honestly, it was kind of like that because I would work and I would keep what I was doing under wraps, except for maybe some close friends at work. So you got to remember, I was still very much a full-time soldier and I didn't, and I was a little, you know, I was three years away from retiring. And I didn't want to be that guy. And, but it wasn't until I got closer to retirement, maybe about 12 months out, that I, you know, I thought, you know, what are they going to do? Bend my dog tags and make me retire, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, but I found that a lot of my superiors and other coworkers and the, 
you know, in the in the field that I worked in and, and such. Um, there were actually, there were some that turned around and walked away because, you know, quite honestly, they didn't believe in it or whatever, but there were others more, more than, uh, you know, those that walked away and that were very curious or huge believers in it. And right. the thing that I found, regardless, and it was more my ignorance, but it was, it doesn't matter what individuals do for a living, uh, because you're dealing with individuals and everybody has different interests and different beliefs. And even though somebody doesn't vocally voice saying, hey, I'm back into this and saying, you know, um, once you start talking about it, sometimes it's interesting to saying, oh, yeah, I'm totally, you know, I totally believe in that or I'm totally, uh, you know, um, you know, into that or whatever the case is. So it's been, it's been interesting. Um, this May was five years since I retired, um, and I've been doing it uh, full time ever since. Um, and you know, it was interesting, Curry, because I was supposed to work for the local VA. That was my plan. That was my retirement plan. You know, retired at twenty four years from the military, go work for the VA um, for another ten to fifteen years, whatever, or you know, or maybe even twenty, because I I was in my I was in my early 40s at the time, and um, and so actually I was 43 at the time when I retired, and so you know I was like, oh, I could I could put in close to another 20 years before I'm 60, and and thinking, but uh, I always say, you know, uh, the old adage of when uh, when man plans, God laughs. So you know, for certainly was kind of chuckling having a good. Joke at or having a choke at my expense. So, um, but it's it's been very humbling. It's been um, certainly a privilege to do what I do every day, and um, you know. So it's I never know what tomorrow is going to bring because um, it's always you know always something new. Obviously, I do the mediumship thing, but. Um, you know, whether it's teaming up with the paranormal investigation team or, or, you know, somebody asking me to come in and do a cleansing of the individual because they consider, you know, they believe that they're possessed or, you know, uh, a, a church, uh, a, a pastor because he believes that his congregation is possessed. I mean, it's always something new and it's something different and it's, um, sometimes I'm just like, oh, you can't, it's, <laughs> you can't make it up. It's like, it's, it's crazy stuff sometimes, but it's... I can certainly, um, I can certainly understand where you're coming from when you say that, um, you know, you really, when you're first, you're, you're skeptical about this sort of thing. I know I came into paranormal investigating really kind of as a skeptic. I, I really hadn't had any personal experiences and, it was really when I had my own, you know, what I would consider significant experience that really kind of raised my eyebrows. But even at that point, I was still questioning, you know, was still kind of stepping back and saying, did I really experience that? Was that my mind playing tricks on me? And I'm just wondering, you had that major significant experience um, and did that really, was that the major turning point? I mean, at that point, where was it? You know, you had the experience with your grandma. You knew that at that point that this was real, or was you still kind of still trying to come to grips with it? So, you know, um, I guess the answer to that is uh, there was still a little bit with me that I was, because it was still learning. That was my starting point, um, you know, and so there was a, still a lot to, I didn't understand a lot of things that was like, you know, okay, so I have this event that, you know, you know, grandma came to visit me. Okay, well, that scared the hell out of me. Now what? Yeah. And saying, oh, all of a sudden now I'm being called a medium and saying, what does that mean? And saying, but at the same time, it's when I would experience, when I went to classes, Curry, or when I would do things, and, and it, when my ego would be very quick to call something BS. Or, you know, I w maybe it wasn't ready to quite go there as far as believing in something. 
it was almost like my grandmother was waving off in the wings. And she would just kind of gently remind me, going, Dean, do you remember, you know, that evening that, you know, I came to visit? And, of course, I'm always like, well, hell yeah, I'll, I'll never forget it, you know, that scared the holy bejesus right off me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, saying, and the only thing that she would ever say is saying, okay, then, how about you just stay open? Meaning, okay, so you can you can't refute what happened that evening. So, saying uh, you understand at least at some level that there's more to this world. There's there's a bigger picture somewhere, even if you don't understand it, or if you're not seeing it or not feeling it. That's okay. Just asking, just to try to stay open. And what I love about it is she never told me at any time, um, you need to stay open or, you know, you will stay open. It was, how about you try to stay open to it? And so it was almost like, okay, like a gentle nudge, if you will. And saying, okay. And it was um, every time I would do that, um, and that same instant that whether it's a modality or something that I was experiencing, it was like I was shown a different, I, I was shown it differently. I was able to get a different um, aspect on it. And it was like I, every time I did that, it was like my mind opened to a different level or a different paradigm. And it was in that paradigm shift for me. And so I would walk away almost every time going, holy crap, that was a cool experience. And so what I learned by that is every time that I didn't resonate with something or maybe it was like, eh, I'm not too sure about that, you know, if I was, you know, and, but after, it was almost like I, you know, I, I started to learn taking grandma's advice and saying, I'm just going to stay open and saying, see what pops up. And every time I would do that, it's, you know, it was almost like you're just, you know, keeping your options open and saying it doesn't mean that you got to drink the Kool-Aid. It just <laughs> means that, you know, just, just stay open to it. If it resonates, beautiful. If not, that's okay, too. But it's just about staying open and, and, uh, and looking at things from a different perspective. And um, so I got to share one. You know, for a long time, even in my early development, um, a lot of people, of course, when, you know, sometimes the paranormal, obviously, the, because they are intermixed, but the, the metaphysic side of the house and, and the paranormal side of the house when they come together. And, but with that, under the paranormal umbrella, so you get a lot of folks that talk about extraterrestrials and, and different entities, right? And so what I would share is, is in my development, of course, you start getting into these, what I would call these circles of different individuals that come together. And, of course, some are very, uh, their interests or their experiences um, are in that realm with extraterrestrials. And that was one area. I, you know, it was something that I had a tough time really kind of believing in, and I was like, you know, I know that there's more to this world, and okay, there's spirit, but I was like, God, I don't know about, you know, um, you know, extraterrestrials, and it wasn't until I had my own experience in the scope of duties being a medium, funny, you know, the, what was funny about, you know, and, but the thing is, is that, you know, uh, it, uh, it, it, it was like a hard pill to, for me to swallow at the time until I had it, the, the experience that I did. And then I was like, holy crap, you know. It's like, all right. So, you know, and, and kind of learning, immersed in that world and saying, all right, well. So it's, it's always interesting. So usually when we, usually when we're kind of, I don't know if you've experienced it, Curry, but anytime that, that I've ever kind of uh, said, well, I, I don't really believe in that or I haven't had that experience or whatever. And that's usually the opportunity. It always seems like spirit of the universe's way of 
saying, well, don't let's let's just help you out a little bit here, and let's just get you a, a opportunity to, uh, to expand your awareness. And so then <laughs> I certainly get a. It's almost like, and then shortly thereafter, then I have an experience to. Uh, broaden my horizon, so to speak. So, sure, and I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the ET portion of this because uh, you know my show is a show about all things paranormal. I've had uh, several right. UFO researchers on the show. You know, Bigfoot researchers. There, there's so many different aspects to the paranormal, and uh, you right. know what you do believe in, what you don't believe in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's different for everybody. And uh, but it, but yep. it is encouraging to hear you say that because there is a lot of people out there that um, you know if it doesn't fit within their um, how do I say it uh, you know I don't want to be too controversial here but if it doesn't fit within their paradigm as far as their religious background yep. they're, they're just going to toss it away or you know I've had people in the military um, you know because I've been studying the UFO issue for over twenty years you know reading about it. It's always been a topic that's been a big concern to me. I really talk about it a lot in my military circles because, again, you know, go back to is somebody going to look at you they're like you have a third eye or that, you know, you're crazy, you know, that sort of thing. I was very, very guarded about what I shared with people in the military. In fact, I really don't think hardly anybody knew that I was involved in paranormal investigating. I just officially retired, um, so I was uh, 12 years on active duty. Another about 13 years as a as an IMA reservist. I don't think I shared it hardly with anybody. Uh, in fact, I would guess that nobody in my reserve unit, which was out of state from where I lived, even knew I was involved in this. They may know now, but at the time, and I was right. very guarded about it. Um, but but you know, it, it is encouraging to hear you mention that because I, I think being involved in this, it's kind of opened up my. Um, it's opened up what I see as possibilities, um, whether it be interdimensional. There's so much to explore in this, and uh, there, there, there's just so much out there. Um, I'm curious because you mentioned you've worked with some other with some paranormal groups. Um, how was the experience you've had, or can you share any of the experience you've had with that? Has that helped any of the groups kind of confirm? Absolutely. So. So I'm going to say is I was kind of a virgin at the whole. I, and I'll just say it for all the paranormal investigators out there because I was really actually excited to to start to do that, and it was and it was actually really recent, and uh, was was my interaction. I'll get into the case here in a minute a little bit, but I want to share is for the longest time I always I really didn't know what paranormal investigators really did now outside of. Okay, you know, trying to capture some form, but I was like, as a medium, this is after I started accepting who I was and what I did and, you know, readings and all that great stuff. And I was like, I didn't understand because I was like, there's always spirits around us. And I was, and I was trying to understand, but at the same time, it wasn't until I really, um, where I started doing like Paracon and, and really started, um, networking and where I, you know, I had a lot of friends with, that have their own um, paranormal organizations and investigation crews. And, and I asked quite bluntly, and I said, excuse the, the ignorance, but I said, what, you know, what do you guys bring to the table? What, what does a paranormal investigator do? What is their purpose? And not saying, not try, I'm just, I said, I'm really kind of curious because they said, I understand that spirits are always around us. And I said, so... I don't understand, you know, <laughs> and saying, but, you know, and then they explained to me trying to get um, physical or scientific proof to provide the client and or whomever um, about the existence of uh, spirits, and then if there's any other, like, details specific, and then, of course, there's different cases, so it depends what the case is, and so I was kind of educated in a little bit. And I was like, okay, that totally makes sense to me. And I was like, that's your approach. And, and I said, I respect that. I said, I was just really curious. Um, but I want to share is that I, um, I, I had a gal that uh, started off as a client. Um, several years ago, she thought she was being possessed by, by spirits. And I said, you're not being possessed. I said, you're a medium. I said, you're not 
you're not uh, owning your your abilities. She went on to take a mediumship course through me, and now she works with orbs. And this is uh, her name is Cindy, and she works with uh, or she has her own paranormal organization with here with the state. And so she went on to become a friend and a colleague. So very interesting. So this is um, so I had a client reach out to me in the western part of the state, um, which is actually almost four hours away from where I live. And it actually just worked out. I was in the neighboring city uh, during a time that worked for the client, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm willing. And she actually reached out to me because she's like, I got a lot of stuff going on. I'm, I'm being put, or, you know, I got family being pushed. I got um, people being touched and handprints being left on. All this when I just put on, say, an umbrella term of paranormal activity, right? And so some very, um, very prevalent, some very, um, very quiet activity, some real, you know, being really noisy. And so we went into the home, and, and actually I had never done a joint uh, investigation up until now. And uh, so my friend uh, Cynthia, she, her and her husband, came, and uh, they actually brought the Connect system, and I think it's called the DR60 uh, for each piece, if I'm getting my new replacer correctly, um, and so for audio, and um, so one of the things they, you know, and then of course, obviously, they had a, uh, a video camera, and um, for anybody interested, by the way, the first part, part one of the video, kind of like a she put together a trailer, part two is coming, but um, she uh, edited the film for that and added the audio and, and such. But um, with that is um, where we went in and, and really had her recap what was going on, and it, it went really well. And, and basically what it boiled down to was, um, yeah, she had a, uh, you know, a lot of spirit activity going on, um, where we uh, connected to her dad um, that was in spirit. And there wasn't really a lot of nasty spirits hanging out. It was just a lot of spirits. And uh, trying to get them to play nice with everything and everybody and and uh, get those that need to cross over to cross over and, and kind of cleanse the space, and we did that. And, and uh, I always kind of go with the, uh, the military... Uh, you know, mentality of you always leave it cleaner than what you found it. So in the sense, I, I always go that sense with the uh, with the energy. So, you know, of course, when we go in, I'm, I said, you know, when we leave, obviously we're going to cleanse the, the energy of your home prior to leaving and, and help, uh, you know, with the spirits and all that great stuff. And so, yeah, so what's really interesting was all about her opening up to her spiritual ability, or her um, God-given abilities and and, um, and kind of quit uh, ignoring them. So it's, um, but it was, it was really cool, some of the, the audio uh, evidence, and then, of course, I had never seen the Connect system either, and I was like, wow, that's, and I, and I actually, that intrigues me, so I was really, uh, I was kind of like a kid in the candy store, kind of, kind of watching all the then work all their systems, and I was like, wow, that's, you know, and then, of course, what was fun is I also, prior to everything, I said I, I wanted to tune in on, you know, do my mediumship thing, and I said I want to tune in and, and see what I get, and then I'll write them down, and then we'll talk about them, but then I want to see what you get on the evident, you know, the evidence that you receive, any EVPs or physical uh you know, um, whether you get something on camera or whatever and, um, and, uh, see if I validate. And, um, so yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, that's the interesting thing here is, um, so I've never worked with a, a psychic or medium on an investigation. Uh, I think it would be fun to do at some time, but, uh, so did any of the work you did coming in with them help validate any of their evidence? Um, as far as what... Uh, oh, absolutely. Ab absolutely, and that's the thing. I think you just have to figure out... I mean, we we, have, 
we have talked since about, you know, how fun it was. And, and obviously, at the end of the day, what you're hoping that you help the, the client. Just like I do when I give a reading, you know, I hope that I'm providing some level of information and, and uh, release for, for the individual that's coming forward. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you're really hoping that, you know, you're providing that client with the evidence or validation that they need to live a healthy and productive life or feel comfortable in their own home, um, you know, and, uh, or, you know, or quite honestly, if they're freaked out, get it to stop. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, it's interesting. It's, and the thing that I found with, um, it, so far, um, I'll say, I'll give that caveat because obviously I'm still learning and, and I think it's with anybody, but you, you know, if you can build a rapport with, and especially if you know the people um, that you're working with, that you just learn to how you're going to, to work it and to really talk about it prior to getting to the client's place of residence and saying, okay, here's here's the deal, here's here's what we should probably do, you know, as far, instead of sitting there and kind of hashing <laughs> everything out in front of the client saying, Okay, let's let's hash this out prior because that way we can, instead of feeling like we're all bumbling and bumping into each other, we can kind of work that out prior. And and so and there was a little bit of that, obviously, with the first time, you know, kind of trying to figure out uh, different things. But um, it, it went. I thought it went really well, and uh, we're actually talking of doing some more as clients reach out to me for, you know for cleansing or whatever of their home and saying, hey, there's some create and actually it, it created a lot of uh, a lot of people reaching out after uh, Cindy had posted the video um, out on Facebook and and by the way, just for any of your listeners, if you're interested in watching any of that, you can either go to my Facebook page, which is Psychic Medium Dean McMurray, the military medium. And you can check it out on my page, or you can go over to my friend Cindy's page at Uncommon Paranormal and uh, Cynthia Ray, and she's got it out there. And uh, it's it's really neat footage. And um, and like I said, part two, since she took so much footage, it's, it's just a lot of editing and a lot of time. And um, of course, in between uh, what she does, you know. Uh, Normal, normal work and and, and uh, her uh, her passion, if you will, and, and um, so yeah. It's interesting. Um, you talked about uh, you know trying to help others to move on. Uh, as a paranormal investigator, my frustration is I don't have the gifts that you have, and um, oftentimes we're really trying to piece things together, whether it be audio. Whatever the case may be, you know, we're usually looking for hard evidence, and, and I think you already alluded to that with the groups you work with, but we very seldom get a name. Um, we very seldom we get some intelligent responses, but it really doesn't leave us with a lot of answers other than we know something's there. We know something has tried to interact with us, and uh, I think that's one of the, <laughs> the frustrating things about this work. Why do why do the spirits, in, from your perspective, why are they hanging on, and um, what helps them to move on? Is are they just looking for closure with something, or? Well, and I think that's important to, but I, I you know, it's, it's um, you know, and I, um, you know, and at, at every level, I think everybody can help and, and bring closure to individuals, but I think everybody's looking for closure at some level and really sometimes even validation of where they are in life. And, you know, they, everybody just wants to be seen, right? And, you know, or, you know, and actually I was, I was talking, I was doing an interview the other day and, and, uh, and somebody asked, or they asked actually for a list of what I think that I do as a medium. And I said, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't trying to, but I was like, like, talk to dead people, and, you know, and I, but they wanted details, like, you know, provide closure to those that are grieving, um, provide insight to those that are looking for 
guidance or insight from spirit. Um, you know, so different things or, or different things that I've done as a medium. And, of course, is it always mediumship? Absolutely not. I mean, just like a, a mechanic has many tools in, in their toolbox, um, the same thing, you know, and, and you kind of read off some of that is, you know, I do dowsing and, you know, home cleansings and different things. And not only uh, that, but also personal, plan, you know, possession cases and remote viewing and other stuff. And so a lot of times, but a lot of times it gets so intertangled or intermixed into the mediumship piece is a lot of times it's, you know, it's, it, it becomes inseparable. And it's uh, just kind of part of what you do. Sometimes it's, you got a message in there from spirit and all of a sudden it's, you know, and I have a friend that uh, one time I asked her, I said, what did you just do? And uh, I think this was early on in my development. And she said, I call it my soup. (laughs) And she said, because it's a little of everything and I don't even know what it's called anymore. (laughs) You know, those that develop themselves either spiritually, metaphysically, it doesn't matter what it is, it's you just it's like almost like a metamorphosis uh you know they might have started off in one area say maybe like reiki or mediumship and all of a sudden over the years it um changes and not that you lose any of that but then it you kind of keep on adding to the you know it's like uh like gumbo right keep on throwing stuff in the pot <laughs> and uh, whatever's in the fridge and so you know it just becomes this in a sense, like my friend shared, soup, and uh, just got a little of everything in it, and um, so, and really, you just stay open to, you know, what uh, uh, what your clients are looking for, and trying to provide that as best you can. Is it hard for? And I think you. Go is, ahead. Is it hard for you to turn this off? Sometimes is it um, something that. You really have to work at to turn off, or they are, I mean, are spirits communicating with you regularly, sure. Just, or is it something you really have to kind of sit down and kind of tune yourself into? Um, well, you know, what's interesting is, well, my true belief is we can never shut it off. Um, I believe that even when we aren't listening, it's still around us. Um, however, when I, um, early on in my, I just, I think it was out of a, almost like a natural survival mechanism almost that, um, I learned how to really tone down my senses and in a sense, for lack of better words, almost shut it off, you know, where it feels like you're shutting it off anyways. And so when I was still in the military, when I would go to work, it's like, okay, I'm at work. I'm not, I'm not connecting to spirits and. But it wasn't until that, you know, I started getting closer to retirement that I was like, you know what, I want to be connected more. And I don't really care about, you know, what people are thinking now. And so I became a little bit more brazen. And so where I left that connection, where I was more aware more often. And so it was interesting because, there, you know, there's been instances where I was working and, you know, uh, you know where a deceased... Uh, you know, soldier that, that I, that I knew when I was serving and, uh, he had passed in, in, uh, Iraq from my ID and he comes strolling in my office and I had to do a double take and then he was gone and I was like, holy oh, crap. And, you know, it was kind of showed up that it was his birthday that, or he was born on that date. So, so it was interesting. I, I get a correction to that. It wasn't his birthday. It was the date of his passing. That's what it was. So it was like an anniversary date of his passing. My my apologies. But, um, you know, so it's interesting. So, but getting back to your question is like now, you know, is it like always, do I need to work at the connection? No, it's pretty quick for me. Um, but it's almost like, um, for example, for today, uh, my Sunday kind of um, – kind of consume most of the day with like doing some drywall patching and and texturing, right? And a little DIY project. And, you know, I didn't really think about anything like about spirits and, um, which is interesting. And, um, 
but obviously I can do it at a drop of a hat if I need to, um, you know, send, hey, do I, you know, need to connect it where it's just, where it just kind of flip a switch, so to speak, in my mind. Um, so, and it's not like a big, um, grandiose, uh, take 30 seconds in spirit or whatever, but, um, it kind of depends too for me. If, if I got a lot of mental load going on and I'm really, my mind is really bogged down with a lot of, uh, you know, dilemmas or dealing with a lot of stuff. Sometimes then, um, and that's usually when it, when, you know, when I'll need to take time to make sure that I clear my mind because I don't want to be connecting. I, when I connect to spirit, I don't use my mind. I use my heart. Um, and that's why I always say because in your mind is your ego driven self and in your heart is your intuitive self. And so that's why I always share is that, you know, that battle between the heart and the head. And, um, so, you know, I always try to, when I'm doing readings, I always try to check my baggage at the door, regardless of what's going on, what family business doesn't matter. And, uh, you know, whatever's going on for the day, I check, check it at the door and, and I, you know, I, I provide services to my clients and then, when I'm done work, then I, you know, go right back to dealing with whatever I need to deal with. If it's my almost teenage daughter kind of having a meltdown because of she can't find an outfit to wear, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's just life. And yeah. so whether my wife is upset that, I don't know, because of something or my son is, you know, uh, I don't know hit a home run, whatever. And it's, but it's, so it's separating. It's life really exists within our conscious or ego, ego centered mind. And what I always share is the doorway to the spiritual realm is through the heart centered space within your heart. And sometimes it can be a challenge to disconnect from that ego. But, you know, at the same time, ego is important to a level, to a, you know, to a, to a, to a level, I guess, to, we don't want to be so involved in our ego that we're egocentric and, and, uh, have the super ego and saying I'm better than everybody and my crap doesn't stink and all that great stuff, right? All right. <laughs> and, but we want just enough to accomplish what we need to accomplish and, um, and, and have, uh, a, a level of self-esteem so we can, you know, believe in ourselves as well, but. Yeah, and, and another question. Kind of rambling a little bit, got off subject, but I guess that ex- I hope that explains what um, the connection piece. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate that. Um, there's there's a lot of talk um, about you know within energy work and that, and I know not um, probably not all psychics and mediums are the same. Uh, there's talk of spirit guides that we have spirit guides. You know, some may say angels. Uh, is this something in your experience that we all have and that, that they do try and interact or help guide us along in our lives? So, um, so yeah, so I, if I understood you correctly, I know our connection is the strongest, but um, if I understood you correctly, you were talking about the talk about spirit, spirit guides, um, angels, and different things like that. That's correct. To help us along in life, and that that's something that, um, and and absolutely, do I believe in that? Absolutely. Um, and have I had experiences with spirit guides and angels? I do. And even in my readings, I even share with um, with folks that because a lot of times in my galleries, I'll get different archangels, and you typically think archangels are a lot. You know, right away they think, oh, Catholic or Oh, Christianity, because there's so many faiths out there, right? Yeah. And the thing, I always tell folks, I don't care what religion you are. And that's not me being, you know, trying, me being insensitive. I'm just being very real because I quite honestly don't because it makes no difference. It has no bearing on my reading. Your religion or non-religion, because I've had people come to me that are... Hindu, I've had people come to me that are Muslim, Catholic, uh, Protestant. I mean, 
almost all faiths, not all of them, but a lot. And um, and I have people, have had people that have come to me that have no faith, that are atheists or, you know, um, all kinds of stuff. Right. And so what I would share is that one thing that I tell folks is, you know, I work with predominantly seven archangels that are found throughout the world's religions. And there are, or I ask them to step forward to reveal stuff about the individual that I'm giving a reading to. Now, is it an angel reading? No, but um, I work with them. They're kind of my helpers during the reading in a sense when, it's, you know, when we're dealing about um, if you think of more on the psychic side of the house, um, however, the thing is, is um, I just really like working with them and their 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 energies, um, and as well as uh, doing, um, I work with them a lot doing also home cleansings and also healings. So, which is um, which is really cool, and I've had a lot of uh, um, great feedback as far as um, the work that 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 has or some of the incidents that happened. But with that is then of course the spirit guide. So my understanding with spirit guides obviously is, you know, we have many, many different guides throughout our life, whether it's for business, love, every aspect of our life, uh, we have a guide in that aspect. And, you know, it's interesting because um, you know, different ones will show up for or something, you know, like, uh, for example, people that really love music, um, you know, they have a spirit guide for that. You know, they might be a very gifted uh, musician or maybe a athlete. Or for me, when I took Delphine, um, I have a spirit guide for that. So, and the same for business. Um, and there's different things if we were to connect to um, our spirit guides, uh, they would have a lot to you know, educate us on or want to share with us. But the other thing is, is, you know, that they're always trying to guide us. And, um, but for some people, they don't believe in that. And you know what? That's okay. Um, and it doesn't m- mean that they're any less relevant. The thing is, is that I just really believe that it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. It's almost like having a toolbox and you have all these fantastic tools in it, but you don't believe in screwdrivers. And so you have all these screwdrivers, but you don't believe in them. Now, does it mean that you can't accomplish the job? No, you can still do it. But the same job, um, maybe just a little bit different, but you can still do just the same, you know. And so at the same time, it's saying you just have more different tools in your toolbox when it comes to that. And a lot of people feel that it's that's more of a Christian based faith or but I would argue that because um with spirit guides and, and angels is, is um when you start exploring it, you know, is it's actually found in a lot of other religions as well. And at some level. And so and it's in everybody works um if they do work with angels um, they all work with them a bit different. It's, there's not a cookie cutter, um, you know, some people do a lot of healing work with angels, other folks uh, maybe just do angel card readings or angel readings. Some folks, you know, um, do different things. So if that makes any sense, is that, if that answers your question. Yeah, I think I think it does, and thank you for that. Uh, does, does your gift ever it, it, at times scare you? Let me uh, explain maybe a little bit more as far as freaking me out that I can talk to dead people. Or yeah, I mean, does it ever just? Is there ever a time where you're just startled by either someone trying to talk to you or something you see? Did it ever just kind of frighten you? I, I wouldn't say frighten anymore. Um, you know, I think a good word would be. Maybe sometimes if I experience something new that I'm not ready for in my mind, um, that maybe I get startled. Um, I wouldn't say scared because, um, you know, that's only probably happened twice where 
something really kind of scared me. Um, and but then, well, I should say maybe three times. But at the same time, is um, you know, and really we understand, you know, with things that scare us, typically it's because we don't understand it. Right. And I think really, you no, know, with the thing with spirits is saying, you know, when I put the, you know, after I started developing my spiritual abilities or my mediumship abilities, it started, you know, I started educating myself and it really took that fear kind of away. Um, but at the same time, you know, sometimes there's things that, um, that might be a new realm or a new experience that kind of startles me and be like, um, you know, might make me, um, step back a little bit and be like, oh, that's new. <laughs> and, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's cool because it's like, what else, well, you know, what else can we do? What else can we experience with this? Sure. And, um, so one one other cool. question I wanted to ask is, um, you know, I mentioned that, you know, I've done paranormal investigation for a number of years now, had some pretty amazing experiences, uh, th but but then I step back and when I come home and or other places and I'm not involved in that realm, if you will, um, I really have not had any success. I, you know, I've 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 had a reading from a psychic medium before. Um, says, you know, you really got to open yourself up to it and kind of quiet in the mind. And I've tried to do that before, but I guess maybe what I'm asking is what advice do you have for me or others who would like to try and reach out to family members, spirit guides or whatever, um, but have not had any success doing it? Is, is there something we can do to try and better communicate with those that may be trying to reach out to sure. us from the other side? Well, first off, I'll share is that you know, Curry, is that, you know, regardless whether you're getting validation back, that we all need to realize is that, you know, our words or when we say, hey, I love your grandma or mom or dad or whomever, is saying that, you know, that we're being heard. But second of all is, more importantly, because we do want that validation that they're around, is what I would share is that, first off, we can start very simply by asking for um, validation through signs. So, you know, so for example, so if you're missing, say, uh, we'll, we'll just say grandma, uh, we'll, we'll, um, grandma Inus, we'll just say. And so missing grandma Inus and saying, hey, grandma, um, I would really love to know that you're around. Could you send me, um, I want to see um, a blue butterfly. And then, you know, ask for this blue butterfly, and then really stay open to how you see it. It could be on a calendar, it could be on a painting, it could be on a drawing, maybe a pop-up window on a computer, um, could be a screen printed on a T-shirt, uh, could be on a billboard. It could literally come up anywhere. And so, and it doesn't have to be a blue butterfly. Uh, it could be something that meant something to you, or... You know, maybe pick something that you typically don't see. And um, this was, uh, you know, uh, last year I was asking for a sign around. I forget what it was. I was asking for a sign for, and they said, I just need a sign. You know what I want to see? I want to see a pink unicorn. And I was kind of being, a, you know, kind of smart. I was trying to be kind of facetious. And uh, lo and behold, I was driving around my neighborhood during the summer, and here is a pink un stuffed unicorn at a garage sale. And I was like, what are the odds of somebody selling a unicorn? And I was like, okay, okay, okay. And I was like, but I want to see a real unicorn. Thinking, ha-ha, top that. And um, so I asked him for validation again. And that evening... I was on, I was looking at uh, Facebook, I believe, and in my feed was a photoshopped picture of a horse, and it was made into a unicorn, and oh, I, I forgot to give you the caveat, they said I wanted to see a, a real pink unicorn, and it was actually colored pink. Wow. And I was like, you, you gotta be, you know, I was like, holy crap. And I was like, 
So, you know, and sometimes when you see that, um, it's just simply going, thank you. You know, just simply saying thanks, even if you don't believe it. Because a lot of times when we've got to kind of train our mind. Remember, we talk about the monkey mind or the ego, right? Right. And so the ego is going to say, well, you know, that's probably been up there for a while. I know, or that's just coincidence. You know, we're going to try to put logic to it in, in the beginning anyways. And so sometimes you have to ask for it again and again. And, and until you start going, you know, um, even if I'm not buying into it, I'm just going to say thank you and ask for another sign. And until we start kind of saying, well, maybe this thing is real. And, you know, and, and kind of, it's not really a game, but it is. You know, another thing you can do to develop your strength with those in spirit um, you can also, uh, I like doing this one, is when you go to, say you're going to go to the local Walmart or Target or whatever big box store that you go to in your area, and saying, okay, uh, say we're still trying to talk to Grandma Ines and saying, hey, uh, Grandma, I'm going to go to the store, and I would really like front row parking. I, I want to get front row parking in the, in the store instead of parking like five blocks away. And, you know, and this See where, you know, if you can get front row parking, ask them to try to get get you front row parking. Yeah, uh, so I'm definitely going to try fun. that one. <laughs> like, hey, I'm going to the store. Um, can you hook me up with some parking? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's really fun. And uh, actually, one time I got to share is um, I was running. It was my wife's birthday. Her birthday is on, just to let everybody know, it's not that I expect birthday cards, but it's on December 31st. So it's a busy time of the year, right? New Year's Eve. And um, I was I, I was behind the ball, and I was going to get her a, uh, a okay. And uh, I was supposed to pick it up earlier, but I was like, oh, crap. And I it was... It's quite a ways away from where I live. I jumped in my car, and at the first red light, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, this place is going to close. I'm not going to get, you know, make it. And I was like, okay. And I kind of reached out to Spirit, and I was like, you really need to help me. Not that it's life or death, but I was like, it would mean a lot to me if you could make the lights all green so I could get there just in time to get this bouquet. And I crap you not that I did not hit a red light. And it was like a five-minute drive. Well, it's about 10 minutes. It's about a 10-minute drive from my house to the store um, where I had to go across town. And I was like, holy crap. I have never hit all green lights like that. And it was so, and I was just like, and every time I did it, because I was coming up and it was red, and I was coming up and it would turn green. And it was so cool. And I was like, I have to just, I just kept on laughing. I was like, this is so cool. Thanks. I was like, keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, and it, but those are just a few examples. And here's the thing. If it doesn't happen for you or if you're not getting the feedback or the, the messages or the the visions or the dreams, continue asking, continue, you know, I know it's frustrating because we want our, you know, our, our mind is like conditioned to saying, you know, uh, to get that feedback, but just trusting saying, okay, well, when it's, when it's time, I'll get it. I trust that, you know, and it's, that can be a hard thing is trusting saying, okay, when it's, when it's supposed to be time, I'll, we'll get the, you know, that message will come forward or I'll, I'll get, get a sign of validation or whatever the case is. So, right. Well, I thank hope you. That answers your question. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, that's definitely some food for thought in, in terms of trying to, to reach out. So, uh, Dean, where can people, can you share the website information where people can find more out about you and, and, and your work? Absolutely. There's a couple places you can go, of course, obviously. Number one, my website at www.themilitarymedium.com, or you can jump over to Facebook, 
at the military, or sorry, psychic medium Dean McMurray, the military medium. And then, of course, out on Twitter, military underscore medium. And uh, out on LinkedIn as well, the military medium. And then, um, and then also on YouTube, if you guys like watching videos, and of course, we'll throw them on Facebook as well. So. Absolutely, and let me take my opportunity to say thank you so much for your years of service to this country, and uh, thank you for the work you do, and the the energy work you do, and the work you do as a psychic medium. I am sure it makes an enormous impact on many people's lives, and uh, thank you for hanging out with me, talking with me, and uh, hopefully down the road again, we can talk again, maybe have you back on the show. Absolutely, and thank you for Curry for having me on. It, it truly was a pleasure, and I appreciate you taking the time and, and fitting me in. And uh, and once again, thank you for your service as well. So it's uh, always a pleasure to uh, share my story. But uh, not only that, but uh, um, you know, talking with all of that. So it's always uh, makes for a great night. All right, thank you, Dean, and uh, you have a great night. Okay, so uh, my next guest is Jake Fife of Five Paranormal. Uh, Jake has been investigating the paranormal for over eight years now and formed Five Paranormal with his father in 2010. And uh, he is also an avid photographer and has uh, been involved in uh, investigating all sorts of locations across Virginia and along the East Coast. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Well, thanks for having me on. It's a huge honor. Yeah, no, it's great to have you on. And uh, and uh, I, if you could kind of take us back a little bit with your journey, because... You look like a pretty young guy, either that or I'm really old. <laughs> Not sure which, but uh, uh, it sounds like you got started in this at a pretty young age. So um, maybe if you could just kind of take us back to how you got started in all this and how you and your father formed up as a team. Oh, sure. Well, the paranormal has always been a part of my life. I mean, the earliest life memory I have is laying in bed when I was probably about the age of two or three and seeing shadow people in the hallway in front of my room, outside my room. So the paranormal has always been there. And I was when I was in kindergarten and first grade, my favorite show on television wasn't, you know, Thomas the Tank Engine or Blues Clues. It was Ghost Hunters on the Sci-Fi Channel. And I watched it every Wednesday at 9 o'clock it came on. And over time, my interest in it, it would go in and out, but I always had experiences. It just got to the point where when I was nine years old, it started happening more and more than it had the previous years. And we were about to move, it was 2009, we were about to move to the place I'm living at now. And I was still having experiences, but I wasn't really thinking about it. I was thinking of school, sports, and some of the other interests I had. So one day, about a week before we moved, I was sitting outside my porch, I was playing with my dog. And I noticed movement up on the top of our ridge. Now, we live in the deep hills uh, of southern West Virginia. And they were working on a water tower about 50 yards further up the ridge from our house. But we had a direct view of it because there was a utility road that went up to it. And I saw two dark figures step out from behind this water tank. And one of them looked like a Native American warrior. Looked like he had a headdress on, had a spear, and the other one almost looked female, slightly shorter, but was sticking very close to him. And both figures that just stood there looking at me. And I could feel them making eye contact with me. And so I'm just sitting there frozen, like, what the heck's going on here? And then my dogs noticed these figures. And they started barking, growling, snarling, and they took off running up the ridge towards these apparitions. And the apparitions, they looked at the dogs, looked back at me, and then walked back behind the water tank. And I was waiting for them to pop out the other side because if someone goes behind that water tank, I should have been able to see them. There's no possible way someone could have disappeared. But I waited and waited. My dogs went around the water tank a few times, and those figures were nowhere to be seen. And after that experience, I pretty much decided for myself, okay, what the heck just happened? I have to know. I finally have to know. And that's when I started asking my dad, who has been a paranormal investigator since the mid to late 80s. And so I told him about my experience, 
and he started telling me some of his thoughts and theories and experiences or his time in the field. And then when we finally moved, it took me a little while to get back into it, but we had a few experiences in the house we're living at now to where we finally decided, okay, we're going to start a paranormal group, and I want to look for answers to these questions that I have. And still to this day, I'm searching for those answers. Yeah, and I think we all are, um, and that's what's so fascinating about the paranormal. Uh, I'm, I've also been involved in paranormal investigating for several years now, and uh, what I like that you mentioned on the site as well on your Facebook page is that you guys don't have the answers, and I think that's important for paranormal investigators because, you know, most of us don't have those answers. We're searching for those answers, but... I like to see that because that really says that you guys are not saying you're experts. Um, you're not claiming to, you know, know it all in this field. And I think that's important uh, as a paranormal investigator to actually just come out and say, hey, we don't have the answers, but we're searching for them. So I, I thought that was really cool. I love that uh, you, you and your father are teamed up, man. I think that's awesome. I think I think that's great. Uh, how long have, so you guys have been working together since 2010 doing this then? Is that correct? Uh, well, we've been working uh, together pretty much all my life. And when we started Fox Paranormal, it was different from investigating with other people because, you know, he's my dad. He's around me 24-7 pretty much. And I'm around him almost 24-7. So we're... we're it's really not an investigation because you can really read the other person. So if the other person is being legitimate about making the claim that they've seen something, you know when that person's lying. You know when they're telling the truth. You you can tell when they're legitimately scared. You can tell when a person is starting to get uncomfortable, which is very important uh, for the safety on an investigation because over everything, we take safety over everything. And sometimes if one person in the group is a little scared, but we don't tell anyone, that can open the doorway for some bad things to happen. So the fact that me and him were able to read each other on investigations, it not only helps us stay safe, but I think it also helps us communicate better with um, the paranormal, the spirit world, because we're not really second-guessing or doubting each other. And that's something that when we started Fight for Normal... I didn't really think about that aspect of working together. Right. Cool. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would ask is, uh, have you guys ever brought any other investigators on the team, or has it always just been you and, and your father? We have brought people on with us to investigate before. Uh, when we went to St. Albans Center, I had a friend of mine that joined us, and we love having people with us because it brings a different approach to the paranormal. Uh, that's something that we love. We have our ways of doing paranormal investigation. You know, our ways may be right, they may be wrong. But we love to see every approach because I think in every approach in the field, there's something unique about it. There is something um, that can be learned from everyone's thoughts and beliefs and investigation techniques. And that's why sometimes we love investigate with people because you get to see a different side, a different dynamic of the paranormal field that you wouldn't see if it was just, you know, the two of us on every investigation. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you can you can certainly learn from others, and it is always interesting to investigate with new people. I agree with that. Uh, talk a little bit, because you really, you know, do some research, it sounds like, uh, before you get prepped for, for an investigation. Talk a little bit about how you prep and get ready for an investigation you're going to do. Well, the first thing I do is, as soon as we have the investigation booked, and also, typically we'll do this about two to three weeks, sometimes even a month out, I will do nothing <laughs> but read about whatever location we're going to. I'm a history buff, and so I love to know every little thing about the location we're going to. And so, you know, if, if uh, we're going to some place like St. Albans, I want to learn about the history of the land before the town was settled. What was here before? Why was the school built there? How did this uh, play a part in the parent? And so you just go down the list to try and figure out why are spirits here? How long have spirits been here? And what 
keeping them here. And then after that, you start reading about, you know, known haunts. Uh, someone sees the ghost of Mr. Smith. Who's Mr. Smith? Why is he here? If we want to talk to Mr. Smith only, what are some questions we can ask Mr. Smith that only he would know? So that if the spirit replies to those questions directed at Mr. Smith, we can confirm or debunk that it's intelligent communication. And then about a week out before the investigation, I'll clean up our equipment, clean off the camera lenses, the camera cards, the sensors, uh, just give everything a fresh energy to it. Um, I like to go in fresh energy because sometimes you can bring back old energy from previous investigations. So I kind of like a clean, clean split to deal with. And then I'll just go through one more uh, checklist of the history, the haunts, uh, form a little bit of a game plan in my mind of this is uh, locate a room I would like to check out. This is something to keep an eye out for. And that's how I approach investigations. But the thing to remember is not every location is the same. So each approach, each setup is going to be different from one location to the next. And you never truly know how you're going to approach an investigation until you actually get there and you walk around. That's only, that's the only time you can get an accurate idea of how the investigation is going to go. Right. So uh, as you guys go into a location, I mean, do you and your father kind of have a little bit different approach? I mean, does he does he have certain strengths that he brings to the table that you don't uh, when you guys come in and investigate together? Or how does that work? Yeah, he, um, going back to the whole history thing, he prefers to go in blind. And so that helps because sometimes um, I can get a little too into the history to where you try to set up or at least I try to set up um, intelligent conversation. But sometimes, you know, you have to, in a way, break the ice. You have to introduce yourself to the spirit and say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. We're not here to hurt you. We'd love to talk to historical spirits here, but if anyone wants to talk to us, here we are. And so he's really good at that. Um, he's also really good at sometimes recognizing a situation outside of the investigation, um, like, you know, the human element. Uh, sometimes there are those moments where stuff starts happening in a row where you get really excited, and it happens to all investigators. You hear a footstep, you hear a voice, and then you think you see something, and you feel that adrenaline start building up, and you want everything you hear to be paranormal. And he's really good at, we call it grounding. We'll stop and be like, all right, deep breaths, on the ground, and then proceed. And also, he taught me how to debunk. Um, and so that's something, that's probably one of my top two or three skills in the paranormal field, I think is essential for every investigator. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree with that. And it's so important to make sure that, you know, we're trying to be as objective as possible when you go into a location and, and uh, try not to, and I think you already just alluded to this, try to not let your emotions get carried away. It's hard to do sometimes. I agree. I mean, there, there are it times is. where, like you said, the adrenaline gets going and something happens and uh, and sometimes it's easy to get carried away. Uh, so let's talk about, so you, you've uh, investigated, it sounds like you've investigated some pretty cool locations. Uh, talk a little bit about some of your favorite locations you've, you've investigated. Uh, some of my favorites... Um between the ages of about 12 and 17, there weren't many places I could because if you look on the website of a lot of locations, they say 18 and up only, 18 and up only. So that was something that it kind of bummed me out uh, my early years in the field. And so I would investigate local legends and cemeteries, which looking back, those are some of the crazier places I've investigated. And that taught me that, you know, any location has the potential to be the most active. Uh, I investigated a Native American burial ground, and it was a Native American burial ground, and then there was one cemetery that's very, very old, dates back, I believe, before the Civil War, and it's on a mound across from the Native American burial mound, and some of the things that happened on the investigation, um, I had growls over the spirit box, I thought I saw a shape moving in the wood line, I couldn't tell, but... Some of the after effects, just, it 
it still disturbs me when you think about something following you home, especially when it, it doesn't seem like a human entity. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can go to an investigation, you come back, and you're a completely different person without even realizing it. And that was something that happened to me that time. Um, and so that kind of sticks with me still. But my favorite location to investigate, that's where I've had my scariest experiences, has definitely been St. Albans Sanatorium uh, in Radford, Virginia. I've investigated that location five or six times now in the past two and a half years. And it's a wild place. If you've never been there, you have to go. It's, every room is insanely haunted. And then, you know, I love, like I said, I love history, and I've investigated Antietam National Battlefield, um, the Pigeon's Roost Battlefield at West Virginia, there's a few other battlefields. And it is really cool to study the history of a location and then actually be able to talk to these people that were there. And for me, that's one of the coolest things about the paranormal is, you know, you read about um, a battle, and then you go to the spot where this, incident happened, and you can ask people that were a part of that moment in time what they thought about it, what actually happened. Right, and uh, I think that's so important to tie the history in with uh, with going in and doing an investigation, and, and, you know, I think ultimately your goal is to try and connect with whatever spirits or whatever are there. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, so you, you've done a lot of research before you go into a location. Can you talk about how that's really, has that really helped you kind of yield some evidence in your investigations? For me, it does. Uh, we have done investigations where we haven't looked into the history of a location. We checked that Nickerson Beach the first time. That was the first, I think, only time I've ever gone into a location historically blocked. And we had a lot of stuff happen. So don't think I'm saying you have to research a location to say activity will happen. Activity will happen even if you don't know the history. The reason I like to know the history of a location is so I can ask location-specific questions. Like uh, I'm checking out the home of Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins. We're getting some cool EVPs and spear box responses. But we, when we asked who's here with us, we had a voice said Mr. Jenkins who, you know, that lines up historically. And I think that adds a bit more credibility to the experience. And then if you ask questions, uh, historically accurate questions, and the spirits give you a historically accurate response, I think that adds more meat to that experience. And that's something that we're wanting to do as paranormal, paranormal investigators. I think everyone should do as a paranormal investigator is try to add as much credibility to each experience as you can. And in my opinion, knowing the history of where you are really helps that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's that's great. You've got to get out there and investigate some Civil War battlefields. Uh, something I would love to do. I visited Gettysburg, but never had a chance to actually investigate. And uh, that's one on the bucket list there. Um, but talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about some of the experiences you've had. Have you had some experiences that have frightened you on investigations? I have. Um, I like to think of myself as someone who really doesn't get startled on investigation. Uh, but there were a few times, I can think of three times off the top of my head, I have been startled. Uh, once was at the Nickerson Sneed House when we were, something was, mess with us. And this is actually on our Fight for Knowledge page. It's a part of our episode. Uh, we would go one end of the hallway, we would see something at the other end. We would go to that end, and it'd be at the other end. We'd just see movement, or we'd hear sound. So, I came up with the idea, hey, let's split up, and let's see if we can, in a way, push it to an area, to where we know exactly where it is. In a way, it's almost like an in in circle maneuver. And so Chris went down one hallway. I went to go down another hallway. And when I turned to face the foyer step, I saw this thing. And it was about six, six and a half feet tall. But it had gray, leathery skin. And it was looking at me. And it was running up the stairs towards me. And then I guess I made a sound of holy blankety blank. And the thing <laughs> stopped. And I thought, turn around and go down the hallway. 
And so I went to go chase after it. Meanwhile, Chris, my dad's running up behind me. And we both went downstairs. And as soon as we got downstairs, there was this growl that we heard come from the room we were in. And it was so loud, our voice recorder picked it up. Our voice recorder in another room picked it up. And our cameras we were holding picked it up. And that was something I was a little unnerved by. But my scariest experience, the only time I've been terrified was we were at St. Albans Sanatorium for an event. It was the Friday the 13th event, May 13th, 2016. And it was about one, it was about midnight, maybe a little after. And we had been hearing some strange stuff in this room, uh, Jacob's room. And the rest of the group, we had no idea where they were. And we, everyone had kind of gotten separate. It was a really weird night. And so we're in Jacob's room with these two other people. And we ask, if you're here, make a sound, tell us where you are. And in the room across from us, it sounded like all hell broke loose. It sounded like someone running with boots on in the room. It sounded like glass shattering, stuff being torn apart. But the thing is, we're looking in this room, and we can't see anything moving. It's just a silent, it's a, not really silent, but there's all this commotion, but nothing moving. Right. And so that was weird. And then our guy comes running into the room and just basically has this almost like he's seen a ghost. Says, Where have you been? We've been looking for you. And when we walked out in the hallway, everyone was in the foyer next to Jacob's room down a set of stairs. But no one could hear us and we couldn't hear them. And even though they had been looking for us, they couldn't hear us and they couldn't see us. But if you've been to St. Albans Sanatorium, that is probably the most echoey place I've ever been in. So the fact that they couldn't hear us or the sounds we were hearing, it, I still find it impossible. So the last thing I remember, <laughs> I was walking out of the room talking to the guide about what had happened. And the next thing I remember is my dad and I are in this other part of the hallway next to and one floor up from the foyer called the Evan Radford Room. Now, I don't remember how we got there. I had never been in that room before, and I don't remember why we went into that room, because it's, it's a very small room, and it's back uh, in the hallway next to another room, and it's back a shorter hallway. So it's, it's really out of the way, and I don't know why we chose that room, but I remember I was looking at a newspaper clipping of Donna Kennedy that was on the wall, and I caught movement out of the corner of my eye, and when I turned to look, there was... A and the only way I can describe it was a blob. And it was about seven, seven and a half feet tall. It was completely black. But its eyes and mouth, which were also black, they seemed to stand out to where I can make them out. And it had this really crooked smile on its face. And we made eye contact. And then it glided back into the room it was in, uh, which is across from us and it looked like it started to go out to the hallway. And I don't know why I did this. This is something that I would never do. And this is something that I know not to do, but I chased it. And <laughs> so I went running through that room out into the hallway. Meanwhile, my dad's yelling, what the heck, what, what, what's going on? And I'm just running full sprint after this thing. And it's not running, it's not walking, it's doing like this weird glide motion. And it goes out into the middle part of the hallway, where you can either go up into the attic, further down the hallway, which is called Demon Hallway appropriately, or, you know, you can stay down and go into another room. And the thing stopped, and it did like a basketball pivot, and it just looked at me. And I barely had time to stop, because I was in a full sprint, and it just stopped all of a sudden from its full sprint. And so I'm standing about three feet away from this thing, and that's the closest I've ever been to anything like that. And it was like I was frozen in place. I could see every little detail about it inside its body. It had like little, it looked like swirls, almost like black hole swirls inside of it. And it had this heat radiating off of it. And it didn't make a sound. It just stood there. And so my dad ran up behind me and he said, back up very slowly. And so we both backed up back to the doorway of Evan Radford's room. 
and we pulled out our spirit box to make real-time communication with it. And still to this day, the responses we got are the clearest I've ever heard over a spirit box. It was as clear as I'm talking to you now, this clear. But it had a scratchy, metallic voice, and it answered pretty much every question we had except for who are you and why are you here. It wouldn't answer those. And so after about what, about 10, 15 minutes, we decided it was for our best safety to get out of there because this thing was slowly moving towards us. And as it moved towards us, it looked like it was getting bigger, which, you know, still to this day, I can see it perfectly in my mind, the thing entering the room slowly, not making a sound. And so we went across the hallway back towards the stairs to get to the main foyer. And when we got there with everyone, first off, no one had noticed we were gone. And when we asked someone, you know, how long had we been gone, they said we had only been gone for about two minutes. Even though when we looked at our voice recorders, the whole experience adds up to a little over 10 minutes on the voice recorder. The other weird thing is the voice of that thing, the blob creature, it doesn't pick up on the voice recorder. It's not there. But you hear my dad and I responding to a voice. You would hear us ask a question. You would hear just silence, just the status of the spirit box. And then you would hear us, did you hear that? It says this, and, but there's nothing there. It's quiet. And still to this day, I had no explanation for the lost time, how we got there, and why its voice didn't pick up, but everything else did. And immediately after that, I started to contact everyone I knew at St. Albans or that had been there. Hey, this is what I just saw. Have you or anyone you know seen anything like that before? And still to this day, I have not met anyone that has seen what I saw in the hallway. And that, to me, is still my most disturbing experience simply because of how much it not only affected me physically, but still a little bit it affects me mentally. Every time I go back into that hallway, I get a little apprehensiveness being in that area because it always feels like, you know, you're going to around the corner and it's going to be right there waiting on you. You know, even as I, I'm telling you this experience, I still get the same exact feeling that I did that night when I saw the thing. The feelings come back. It's almost like you replay that event physically and mentally. You just don't see it. Right. Yeah, the uh, the amazing thing about that is is you actually ran towards this entity where probably about 90% of the people would have been running out of the place <laughs> after they saw that. So, yeah. You know, that's probably what I would have done, but... I don't know why I chased it. That's just, I talked to someone, they said, you know, it could have been partial possession, or there's a few reasons. It could have been, you know, like a survival and see something run you go for, but I don't know. I was kind of hoping I would have been a better investigator at that point than not to run after these things. But, you know, like I said, it felt like I didn't have control of anything. Right. Yeah, that that sounds like a pretty uh, pretty amazing experience, and uh, I, I could see how that that could uh, possibly be a little bit alarming as well. Going back into the location after having that kind of experience. Now, you also research uh, a lot of legends. Is that true? Oh, I love local legends. Now, have you have you found in some of the research you've done into local legends? Have you actually also done some follow-up investigating that has helped uh, verify any of the any of the stories or the legends? The only one uh, that I've been able to do serious follow-up investigations on would be the legend of Alice Black, um, which she, that's based out of Pauley's Island, South Carolina, and basically she was this girl who was born about eighteen thirty-two, eighteen thirty-three. And she died uh, about 1849, 1850, allegedly of a broken heart. Um, and what's interesting is during the Civil War, during Sherman's march to the sea, uh, the courthouse that contained her records and her family's records, they were completely destroyed. And so the only thing that we have left that we know of is, you know, her birth year, her death certificate, and a record that she was sent to this 
uh, school. But other than that, it's completely pure local legend and pack, stories passed down from the family. And so allegedly, uh, at her old home, the Hermitage, and at the cemetery called the All Saints Church Cemetery, people still see her because she was secretly engaged to this man, and it was against her family's wishes, and so her brother, who found the ring, threw it into the marsh, and that allegedly is what led to the broken heart, her dying, and why she still haunts the place. She's still looking for her ring. And I became instantly fascinated by this. And this was the first ghost story I became fascinated with, about the age of eight or nine. And so I started reading as much as I could, trying to fill in the missing pieces. And in 2014 was the first time I investigated her cemetery, which is a beautiful cemetery, uh, very, very active to see. One of the most active places I've ever been. And through the spirit box, we did get a female voice that responded to the name Alice. Um, we were able to make contact with her brother, who allegedly tried to run people off. He tried to ask her questions. And about 2016, I contacted the local historical society down there. And we were basically trying to search all over the Internet, and they were looking in local libraries to find any obscure reference, any obscure uh, record or mentioning from an old book or article that may shed some light on what really happened. And we made a little bit of progress. We found out a possible name for the guy she was engaged to. And there was a session I did the next year that I went there in 2017, and we did get uh, some activity from her brother when we brought up the name of the person we think she's engaged to, John Braddock. And so, you know, that tells me, okay, we might be on to something here. Um, I also, doing some research and talking with some friends of the modern-day flag family, they told me that she might not have even died in the Hermitage, the home where, you know, her spirit is supposed to be, the ring is supposed to be close to the house. The house, I found a record, wasn't completed until about April of 1849, and she died in February of 1849. So it's a little bit of an interesting possibility, between, you know, was she, were they living in the house, and it just wasn't officially completed? We don't know. And then I found that through another uh, part of the story, there's about three or four different versions to the story, that her and her family's body may not be at the All Saints Church Cemetery. Um, I found, and one of my friends who is at like the historical site, he found a reference that in 1960 or 1961, their bodies were moved from the All Saints Church Cemetery in Pollock Island, South Carolina, to the Prince Frederick Episcopal Church in, I believe it's called Plannersville, uh, South Carolina, which is about 20, 30 minutes northwest of Charleston, South Carolina. And there was a person who I put out this big search saying, hey, everyone in this area, paranormal or not, if you know something, let us know. And I had someone contact me uh, with a picture saying, hey, this is um, a record from the church from the mid-1960s of the cemetery directory and listed on there is an Alice flag, as well as the other members of the church family. So there are records to say their bodies were moved, but then another bombshell was dropped saying that her brother Allard had his own daughter, he named Alice. And so, you know, that added the whole fuel to the fire of, you know, there's only one Alice grave at each cemetery. And allegedly his daughter Alice died about age two. And so we don't know if it's the Alice flag of the spirit that at the Prince Frederick or if she's back at the All Saints Church. And so when we went this year, that's something I wanted to finally prove once and for all. And sadly, we weren't able to. We did get a spirit box voice when we asked if she was buried there, if Alice Black herself was buried there. We had a voice that said no. So, you know, that's something that you take with a grain of salt until you can find some historical records to back it up. But that's something that still to this day, I want to one day complete that legend. I want to finally fill in all the missing pieces. Wow. 
Fascinating. Uh, talk a little bit about, because it sounds like you and your father like to experiment with equipment. Talk a little bit about how your equipment comes into play in uh, doing investigations. Well, the equipment for us, um, we like to take a light approach. Um, we don't like to be bogged down as much with, you know, a bunch of cameras, a bunch of lighting, a bunch of voice recorders, because if, you know, something happens at the other end of a facility down the hallway, we don't want to have to take, you know, 30 seconds to a minute to pack everything up and get down there. We want to be able to go down there as the experience is happening. So we typically with us only carry a camera, our phones, a uh, spirit box, voice recorder, and sometimes a K2 So it's about four or five things. And we believe that the less equipment you have, the more experience and possibly more evidence you'll have because, you know, we think of spirits as, we treat them as normal people. So would you go into someone's home that you don't know with a bunch of equipment and just start setting it up all around them and then start asking questions. No, you wouldn't. It's not very courteous. So we treat the spirits, we approach spirits like we would, you know, a stranger or a regular person because I think that, you know, it makes them feel like, okay, we're alive again in a sense. This is someone who, you know, isn't, you know, poking prod at us with a bunch of equipment. And that's just been our experience with it. And so we have equipment to help the spirits communicate with us to where we can hear them in real time. And we also use the equipment to validate any and back up any experiences that we have. So predominantly for us, the equipment is used to verify what we experience in the field. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that. And, uh, Jake, thank you for hanging out with me and talking with me. Uh, if others want to find more information about you and Fife Paranormal, where do they go? Uh, people can go to facebook.com slash Fife Paranormal. That's where pretty much all of our work is found. You can also check out our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Fife Paranormal. All right, great. Hey, Jake, once again, thank you for hanging out with me, and uh, I look forward to talking with you again down the road, and uh, you have a great night. You too. Thank you for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. Take care. Okay, so that's going to about do it for tonight's show. Once again, thank you for tuning into the show. I really hope you enjoyed the show. That's, that's the first time we've had two guests on the show. And join me next month when my guest will be Nomar Slevik. And uh, Nomar is actually a UFO researcher and author. He's written a different, couple of different books on the UFO issue. Uh, his most recent book is entitled Otherworldly Encounters, Evidence of UFO Sightings and Abductions. So it's going to be great to hear his, uh, get his insight into all the research he's done on uh, UFO cases out in the Northeast. And uh, really looking forward to that one. So once again, thank you for tuning in. And we'll look forward to next month's show. Have a great night.